Hey guys, thank you so much for joining us uh, for another live session. My name is Manny, and today we have uh, the pleasure of being graced with uh, one of the senior lighters uh, from Naughty Dog, Boone Cotter. Um, before we uh, switch everything over to him, I'm going to do a couple of things. First, first and foremost, Happy New Year to everybody. Once again, thank you for joining us. Um, hope uh, 2017 is treating you right. Um, here stateside, some people might not think so, but, uh, that's for another conversation. Um, so, uh, as you guys know, if you've done these sessions with us before, um, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to post them in the chat window. Uh, and, um, I'll, uh, shoot those over to Boone, you know, as we go through the session. Um, if you, um, if you're experiencing a lower quality video, you could also you could always watch it uh, through YouTube. I believe for you guys, it's uh, it's in the uh, lower lower right hand corner, um, so you can see it there. Um, we're gonna have tons, you know, of these sessions coming up over the next uh, few months. So um, definitely make sure to look out for that. Um, so I'm just gonna shut up now, and I'm gonna switch things over uh, to Boone. Boone, uh, take it away. And once again, thank you. Uh, Thank you for taking time, you know, taking your weekend uh, to uh, share with us and, you know, kind of join in on the session. Oh, man, my pleasure. I'm really excited about this. I think uh, there's a there's a shortage of lighting info out there. And I found this when I was trying to learn how to do this kind of stuff. It was difficult to find great resources. And hopefully I can help fix that a little and put some of what I do out there and what we do at Naughty Dog and uh, talk about our processes and our approach and how we get the results we get. I mean, that is the goal. I mean, uh, I'm, should I talk a little about how I started, where I yeah, began? Yeah. I mean, is that... Us, uh, yeah, give us a little introduction, you know, in terms of uh, how you got started. Yeah. All right. Well, I, I mean, I'll try to keep it fairly short, but I'll <laughs> go back to I was three years old. No, I'm not going to go back that far. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I, uh, I'd say I probably started in this field. I was in high school in 1994, way back, and uh, studying art. And my art teacher showed me two Pixar films. It was uh, Red's Dream, the one about the unicycle, and Tin Toy. And I was like, okay, this is what I'm going to do. This I love this thing. So my school was really cool, and they set me up with an Amiga 500 back in the day with Imagine 3D. And I spent some time playing with that. And uh, kind of just got addicted at that point. And from there forward, uh, I've always been a gamer. So it was definitely games that I wanted to get into. But uh, opportunity seemed a little bit difficult. I mean, it's Australian. Australia didn't seem to have a great deal of avenues, especially back then. Uh, how did you get into video games? It was There was no big AAA companies back then, really. I mean, EA existed. But, you know, this wasn't a time when people were putting you know, multi-million dollar games on the market. Uh, film seemed like the better approach for me career-wise. So that's what I focused on. I went to college and I went to college late. I worked for a while and at some point decided that, no, this is, I'm not chasing my dreams. I'm going to go to college and be really broke and live on my <laughs> own for four years. We've and all studied, been there. Yeah, right. But it's character building. So <laughs> I... Uh, I studied communication design, which kind of focused on web design and some animation. And it was, again, this was before all of this stuff was really huge. I mean, YouTube didn't even exist back then. So it was difficult to find resources online. Uh, the course that I studied seemed like the right thing to do. And it certainly gave me an avenue. I kind of spent my time focusing on 3D animation. And at the time, I was really interested in characters. I liked character rigging and animation and character skinning and kind of very technical kind of work. And uh, I wrote some small scripts and some tools and so on. And I got a job in film. Oh, in TV, actually. I worked on, I'm, I don't even want to say this. I worked on Animalia, the, uh, this children's animated TV series. I went on as a a uh, character rigger and when my contract ended i didn't want to not be unemployed anymore so i looked around at what else people were doing in the studio and lighting really stuck to me i i loved it i liked photography I'm not particularly good at photography i'm trying to be better but uh 
I very much enjoyed the lighting. I liked what it did. I liked that it took a scene with these this art that other people have produced and it kind of elevated it and showcased it and shaped it and gave it form and character and mood. And it seemed really significant and spoke to me in a way. So I taught myself lighting more or less. As I said, there weren't a lot of resources back then. So just lots and lots of reading and uh, practice and trying to copy photographs a lot. I'd see a photograph and I'd produce a basic model of the photograph and then try to copy the lighting, which I still do today. It's, I think that's a really good exercise. From there, I did some VFX work on Baz Luhrmann's Australia, which is shouldn't be surprising being Australian. As I said, there's only about seven of us, so we do work on those things a lot. And from there, I uh, ended up at Chrome Studios, which at the time was, I think, the world's biggest independent game developer. Uh, it was one, certainly Australia's biggest game studio, but then the global financial crisis hit, unfortunately. And as we know, that hit a lot of the creative industries really hard. And uh, that ended, I did some time teaching and bounced around all over the place. So this certainly hasn't been a straight path. It's been a very windy path. And then uh, then Naughty Dog, which I, I, I like telling this story because to me, it kind of emphasizes that people should definitely go after what they want to do. I was, uh, I think it was midnight one night. And I, I, of course, always wanted to work at Naughty Dog. I played The Last of Us and I'll explain why The Last of Us really talked to me so significantly and why I uh, why Naughty Dog was absolutely where I needed to be. Uh, but I, what was I up to? Uh, yeah, so I, it was, I don't know, it was late one night and I was like, well, I'm not ready to apply, but I'm going to apply. I'm going to send an email off and what is to lose? So I sent an email off and they sent me a lighting test. I did the test and then it kind of all just ran from there. I got a phone call and flew over for an interview, which FYI, my first time out of Australia. So I jumped on a plane and flew to LA and I was, I felt like I was Crocodile Dundee th throwing cans at people that were stealing handbags or something. <laughs> I don't know. But uh, actually, I felt like I was in GTA. It was the weirdest thing. I walk around LA and I'm like, oh my God, I think I beat someone up and stole their wallet on that corner. <laughs> you know? And uh, yes, I had the interview and they, uh, they liked me and they hired me and that's how I ended up at Naughty Dog. So it's it's all a little bit crazy to me still. It's, it's a little odd to work for a company that I'm an enormous fan of. So it's there's a lot of responsibility and respect and uh, passion and interest and just constantly pinching myself. But uh, cool. I very much love being there. So. That was great. And as you said, it's uh, just just that drive to just go after it, right? Yeah, that's right. I mean, you you really need that. It, you know, you need to find something you're passionate about because everybody knows you can't you can't learn something to the extent that you need to to be a professional, especially a world leader in something, unless you are absolutely passionate about it. Yeah. I, mean, I I hate modeling, right? Like, I really can't stand modeling. I love I love looking at models. I love beautifully modeled environments, but it's not something that that drives me. And yeah. I I found it really difficult to learn to model because I wasn't that interested in it. So yeah. to come home and sit down and think, oh, I'm going to spend three hours modeling now. Ugh, God, it's just, it drove me nuts. So I, uh, but, but I knew that I wanted to light and I had this kind of, uh, I felt like I had a roadblock for a while that I wanted to be a lighting artist, but I couldn't model. So how could I model these scenes and texture them and do all of this immense work leading up to where I got to light the scene and showcase my lighting. Yeah. Um, oh, dude, it's a, uh... It's a, it's, it's a testament as, um, as Anna is saying, living the dream. So, yeah. um, all right. So speaking about lighting, since, yeah. uh, you know, that's, uh, that's what we're here for. Uh -huh. Um, could you give us a, a, a little bit of a, just of a walkthrough in terms of your process and how you work, um, and how you light, um, at, you know, let's say a place like Naughty Dog, like what's your process? For sure. I mean, it's it's a little difficult to describe succinctly. I mean, lighting is a very organic process. It's uh, some parts of what we do is very procedural, right? You can give someone a list of things to do and they'll tick off the list and, uh, you know, step one, add a sky dome and set it to this intensity. Step two, add a sun, set it to this intensity. And there is a little of that. And that's kind of, that bleeds into a very organic, experimental, playful state of mind where you're trying things, you're dropping lights in, you're hitting render, you're seeing what happens. But 
generally a scene uh, depends on the level at Naughty Dog. Different companies work differently. But so, for example, the prison, which you're looking at right now, uh, I a lot of this I had no concept for. So I had a lot of liberty to go into the scenes and say, okay, how do I want to light this? I kind of know the mood of the space. I know that it's this hot, sunny, Panamanian kind of prison. There's, uh, there, it, it needed to feel a certain way. So I knew that going in. So I'd find some reference photography or even some, some concept art or anything online that kind of captured that feeling. And I'd look for what made that scene feel that way. And the first step from that is to get your sun and dome, which doesn't sound very exciting. It sounds a little boring, just that step, but that is one of the most critical is to drop your sky in and pick a sky and make sure the sky works well, especially with something like Uncharted, which is a little pulpy and colorful and action movie. So skies are really important because they help set the mood. It's not just a time of day thing. It's about the mood of the space you're in. So look for a sky dome that works, uh, which would later be painted into a into a complete sky. So we often have choice over that. Sometimes the art director will step in and say, you know, I, I want you to use this specific look. I want you to use this specific sky. I want you to use this specific time of day. But for most of my levels, it was it was more or less on me. So I would drop in a sky, drop in a sun and then spend a few days just moving the sun around, moving through the level and looking for what looked good and felt good. And there's a lot of trusting your gut in that at that step. I think uh, that's where lighting kind of bridges science, technology and art. So you need to understand the science of light to understand what looks good and why it looks good and why it feels realistic to the human eye. If you don't understand the science, then you're going to make those kind of mistakes where you're looking at the scene, you're going, this doesn't look very real and I can't really tell why. There's a technology, you've got all of these tools and they they all have limitations because we're simulating and emulating. We're not actually uh, producing real photorealism. We're using a bunch of tools which have uh, many options, many switches and dials and uh, cheats and hacks that we can do to try and get a result. But it's not a case of just going, clicking the make photorealistic button or make moody button or whatever else so we we uh need to be prepared to spend a lot of time kind of moving from the sun and sky and getting that stuff in and getting a fairly realistic base that feels good to moving through the level uh, for example this one here i'll just pause it on this shot so uh this had to feel a specific way we wanted this moment where you come up out of the solitary and you walk into the sunlight and it feels very blinding and overwhelming which meant that I had to push the exposure a lot on the outside, which meant it created all of this extra contrast, which each choice introduced some problems that had to be solved. So if you're looking at this concrete walkway, uh, there's quite a lot of natural light spilling into this space and the bake did not have that uh, with the sun and dome. So I ended up putting a directional light that's more or less like a very soft sun pointing down at the ground and I disabled the direct component on that light. So all of this extra indirect light is bouncing up into this space coming from that one directional light. So there'll be a lot of those kinds of choices where you need to experiment and hack and play around and see what works and uh, lots and lots of area lights, spotlights, extra fill lights. It's kind of like in a way lighting cinema. I mean, you when you light a shot for film, you have this wonderful advantage that the camera is locked and no one can see what's behind the camera. But if you've ever looked at stage lighting or set lighting for a TV episode or for a feature film, there's always like tens, 20, 30, a hundred extra lights, you know, like there's lights everywhere and they're all shining in to get this very specific look. And when the player is control of, in control of the frame, that creates a really difficult challenge for us because if I put a I can't just put a light behind the camera shining in a specific direction to get a look because if the player turns the camera that breaks so there's a lot of experimentation and uh, iteration on that on on getting the look you want and then making that look feel natural so pushing extra light in through a window but then making sure that when the player walks outside there isn't some weird big extra glow on the outside of the window you know stuff like that so uh, from there once we've got kind of a base lighting pass, which is uh, everything starts to feel 
fairly realistic and nice to look at. We do an artistic pass, which is you'll go through and focus on details. You know, you'll come around a corner and there's a chair in the corner of the room and you think, you know what, I, I kind of would like if this chair was a little bit of a focal point. So you'll add an extra light just to kick that chair a little or uh, some lights to highlight specific characters or especially gameplay. You know, you'll go through and have a look. If I go to, I think it's the next frame. So this one, uh, these tunnels, they're in the in the base bake there just wasn't much light getting into these uh halls and the light that's you see kind of hitting the walls that's totally faked I mean, there's extra lights put in to make it look this way for for a reason to kind of shape this and the room at the end of the hallway i, I put lights in there because it felt nice compositionally to have this focal point in in the dark so moving between spaces of light and dark and then you have these characters beating up some guy on the right and originally they weren't particular they weren't standing out too well so i added extra runtime lights so they're hitting just those characters so as you walk into the space those characters highlight and pop and you can see that they're being really brutal and beating this poor guy up so you start to do these gameplay kind of beats and move through the level over and over and over again and look for things that just that feel really good and emphasize those things and look for bits that feel a bit off so you might uh, maybe look down this hallway and think uh, you know the foreground and the midground are very flat right now and this is this is true looking at this space i would say you know maybe i could have pulled a little of the foreground out and left that that central light there the dominant light rather than kind of keeping them fairly balanced it might have been a better composition uh, so if i was still working on this level i would try that and see what see what the result was and trust my gut on whether it felt better and kind of move from there so the key gameplay concerns were navigation making sure the player can always navigate which is super challenging especially on dark interiors because you want to sell that it's dark and gloomy but you don't want the player to get lost and we have these issues where everybody's playing on a different television right and some tvs will crunch the blacks really bad so if i want something to feel nice and moody and dark i push it dark but then i need to test it on a bunch of tvs and i might find you know on this television it's so dark the player can't navigate so i need to lift and then suddenly i lose that contrast so how do i get the contrast back and again it's still that same iteration of tweaking and uh attempting to kind of get that result and from that point sorry i'm yammering on really fast here slow me down if i'm talking too fast but from no, that I think, point i think you're good excellent so from that point uh we will I'm just going to check the next slide. Yeah, so uh, from that point, this is a good example, I think, of uh, like the artistic pass. If most of the light in this space is completely faked. So those tiny windows that exist in the walls there don't cast anywhere near this much light into this room. So the artistic pass was, I think there's maybe maybe 12 area lights in this room, area lights and spotlights, kind of casting extra light up on the walls and making some surfaces warm and some cool solar forms read so that you feel like you can clearly read the archways and the the stairs and the walls and the ceiling and the tunnels and so on uh from that point we go into kind of a post process where so in at naughty dog the lighting artists are responsible for uh, a lot of a lot of the post work using a render setting system so we can control exposure uh which is critical. You need to make sure that your exposure always feels quite natural and doesn't yo-yo too much. It, you don't want it to bounce around as the player turns their head and suddenly it gets dark because there's a bright spot on the wall. There's a there's a lot of fine tuning to get that to feel nice. Uh, we'll, we'll dial in fog so that you can start to read distance well and uh, lots and lots of other settings that might might tweak your your tonal range or your, uh, your tint or the way that colors read or... Uh, kind of, there are seriously hundreds of these settings. And the final step generally is to do a LUT, a color lookup table. So we grade the final image, which will give you kind of different results. So you can make something feel warmer or cooler or more contrasty or less contrasty or kind of balance the overall lighting in, in a different way. And uh, while I explain all of that in a linear process, you know, starting with concept, then do it, figuring out your time of day and your sky and your sun direction then then making sure the game plays well and the player can see what they're doing then doing your art pass and then doing your lot your render settings and your lot at the end the reality is that entire process is like spaghetti so you'll do a pass and then i might jump in and do the lot second because i'm i have this idea that i really want to try and then i'll start on the render settings then i'll go back to the first pass again and move the sun 
then I'll start doing an art pass on one specific area because it feels quite nice. Uh, then I'll notice I need to move the sun direction again. And so it's, it's very organic, very fluid, constantly iterating and looking for uh, the best possible result, I guess. Cool. No. And it's, uh, I mean, obviously the process works extremely well because just kind of looking at some of the images, it's a testament to this, the quality of the art you're able to produce from all of those. So, well, it has um, to be, has to be said that, uh, I, Naughty Dog has some of the best environment modelers and textures I've ever seen. These guys are amazing and they make my lighting work <laughs> so much easier. It's, it, it has been a joy to light these scenes. So it's, it's great, you know, crap in crap out, right? It's like yeah, that's when right. you have yep. amazing stuff when you have an amazing canvas, it's uh it it makes your job that much more enjoyable. No know? one wants to polish a turd. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Nobody. Nobody. Um, so all right, great. So we have tons of questions um that you know we're gonna try to get through as much as we can. And we're gonna take a couple based on you know some of the stuff that you're covering initially. Um awesome. so uh um Cassidy is, is, is asking how many of these renders are in engine? Every single one of them. All of them. All real time in engine. None of the, none of these are cheated at all. This is literally just screen grabbed from the game. Wow. Amazing. <laughs> now they look that much better. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, our technicians do some magic. I tell you. Oh man. It's a uh, great stuff. Uh, um, SM wants to know, where do you get the sky domes uh, from? Is there an existing library at the studio uh, or do you create them from scratch? Uh, we have an existing library of uh, skies that people have photographed in Naughty Dog. Uh, I might photograph a sky. I might paint one. You know, sometimes I, I have a vague idea of the feel I want. I'm, I'm not an illustrator, by the way. I'm not going to paint a nice sky. But a sky dome is such a diffuse light source that a really rough version of it tends to work pretty well. In fact, sometimes uh, the rough painted sky dome I use ends up making it into the final game. And the concept artist or the artist responsible for painting the sky for that level will roughly match it. And it just feels right. So, uh, for example, the epilogue, I used a... Actually, for the epilogue, I just used a clear blue sky to, to bake with. It was, even though there's clouds in the sky, uh, I used a blue sky with no gradient because it felt better to me. So again, that's cool. about trusting your gut. Definitely. Um, so uh, Claudia wants to know the, uh, the, um, the fidelity in Uncharted 4 is really amazing. Do you have specific process um, to keep on track or is it guaranteed um, um, by the in-house tool? Oh, this is just hard work. I mean, we, uh, everybody there, everybody at Naughty Dog is super passionate and has the thrill of being able to take some ownership. I mean, we, uh, I think there's been talks before about how our studio runs a, a little differently to what I'm used to. There's not really, I mean, there's, there's, there's an art director and there's a creative director and these people will sometimes have really clear ideas that they communicate. But often too, you'll, uh, I'll put my hand up and I'll take a level because I like the idea of that level. No one's, no one's assigning it to me. I get it and uh, I have to make some choices, creative choices and I'm trusted to make those choices. And that's, that's wonderful. That's, uh, it's a lot of responsibility and it's terrifying sometimes, especially I, I say that there is this, there's this process as an artist that I, I, believe is true for most of us and i think i've told you this one before many but there's like six steps and i read this oh, online yeah. once and i love this one step one is this is awesome step two is this is tricky step three this is shit step four i am shit step five this might be okay step six this is awesome now i go through that with every single level i go in with an idea i start aiming for it it's it all goes wrong uh, I start trying to solve it. I start figuring out what works and then just trust in your gut as an artist that you are going to find it. Keep looking for it and it w it will be there somewhere. So, yeah, I completely agree. It's, yeah. uh, it's like whether it's lighting, modeling, animation, I think that's just a part of the process. That's, that's right. So, so, so we have some, we have some wonderful tools and we have some amazing tool developers and they, they're all developing things constantly to help our workflow and to help us work faster because it, it's all about iteration, right? Like you need to be able to iterate really quickly, create something, get it in because everybody's working on dependencies. So as a lighting artist, I kind of want them some, some decent representations of the models and materials in as quickly as possible so I can start lighting. So we all iterate, but everything in the scene is, is 
pretty much hand placed. I mean, this is this is all deliberate choices. There's nothing here that's automated. Yeah. So uh, phenomenal stuff. I think that's why we get the results we get. So I like that a lot. Cool. Uh, Brandon uh, wants to know how has the move to uh, BPR uh, BPR um, affected your job as a lighter? Ah, that's a great one. So in some ways it's made it easier, in some ways it's made it harder. So I, in some of my earlier work, I worked with uh, RenderMan, uh, I worked with Mendel Ray, uh, I worked with some renderers that did have uh, some decent PBR workflows, uh, not real-time stuff, but uh, offline renders. And, but they also, there was a lot of cheating and there was a lot of hacking and there was a lot of, uh, you know, I want to bounce from a particular light so i'd put an area light in and i'd actually fake the bounce using an area light and there's the thing is when we when we move to pbr we don't really give that up we just get closer to a realistic result faster so just adding a sun and sky in some levels almost looks final i mean you can get something really really nice out of that but i mean that's we aren't satisfied with that we want to move in and we want to start breaking those rules and so there are times when we break PBR. I mean, I've, I I know in some levels the reflections in puddles weren't bright enough, so I boosted the sky quite a lot. And I when I caught the cube maps, when I did the cube map capture, so it's a process whereby we uh, capture all the cube maps for a level and generate them, and the reflections start working. Uh, when I do that, sometimes I really cheat it. I push the sky really bright so that the sky reflects uh, brighter than it would in reality, but it just looks nicer. And again, that comes back to trusting your gut. But the goal is to kind of stick to a PBR workflow as much as possible because it also creates consistency in your look. You don't want to break it too much. Uh, just break it when you really need to, I guess. Cool. Eric uh, Du is asking, I'm a senior lighter as well, uh, trying to push that final 10 to 15% in our game. Color grading and the use of LUTs um, have been neglected in our pipeline. Um, I've had no production experience in this area. What kind of tools and workflow do you use to achieve that final 10 to 15%? Okay. I, yeah, th that's, this is huge. Uh, being able to do a color grade is all the difference in the world. I, I don't have it handy, but I have, I do have, let me get to this shot. So I have this shot somewhere as a, as a GIF or GIF. Don't kill me either way I say it. Uh, I'm going to say GIF because it's graphics, just saying. Yeah, I'm going to go with the same thing. Uh, yeah, I have a GIF that has this shot uh, this with just Sun and Dome, then with uh, the Artistic Pass, then with the Color Grade. And there's a huge difference between the, the pre-Color Grade and post-Color Grade. I mean, that's really what takes it the final kind of more or less photorealistic look. Whereas some levels, like, uh, say, th this one, look almost exactly the same pre and post LUT. So it kind of depends, but that LUT, having that LUT as an option is really, really important. As to the workflow that we use for that, behind the scenes, I am not too sure. I, I know Waylon Brink, uh, one of our amazing uh, technical artists, developed a system for us to do HDR LUTs. So we can, we can color grade values above one, which allows us to tone map uh, ultra bright values beyond one into a zero to one range, which was kind of critical to getting uh, the look in the interiors here and and absolutely critical for this look in the in the epilogue level. Uh, he did do a talk on that. So you might be able to find that online. I maybe I can send many the link and he can yeah. forward that on. But uh, that's he talks about that a little as for our workflow as an artist, uh, I take a screenshot of the level in linear color space. I bring it into a compositing package like Fusion or Nuke or even Photoshop. I grade the image using the tools in that software package and I export the LUT from that. And in game, it just works. It's for, for the artist, it's a really, really simple and organic workflow. And I like it a lot because I can, I can get in there and use the color curves to push. I can punch the saturation of the greens or uh, crunch the shadows a little or soften the highlights. So kind of do anything I want as a final step. And as you would know, uh, doing that in render is really expensive. I mean, you, you need to adjust all your lights and send off another bake. And on some of these levels, the bakes take you know, eight, 12 hours for a result. But being able to do it in a LUT and get your results instantaneously is really nice. So our tools allow us to change the LUT and have it live update in game, which is cool. just wonderful. I love it. Perfect. Um, so, and this is something that um, I want 
to touch upon. This is something that we, you and I spoke about yesterday after seeing some of your work and what you submitted to Naughty Dog. So I definitely want to take, you know, I want, I would love for you to take a few minutes, you know, to kind of showcase that. But the question is from Allie, um, how would you suggest going about building a portfolio when you can't model or texture? Oh, wonderful so, question. Oh, so I boom. love this question. Boom. I know. You couldn't, okay. We couldn't write this. This is perfect. So, all right. So I am, I'm, I'm about to show you the, the reel I got into Naughty Dog on. Uh, I, you may be shocked. I am shocked sometimes. It's probably not what you're anticipating, but, uh, let me just get into my browser here. So this is the work. You can see this, Manny. Is this coming through fine? Yeah, I can see okay. it perfectly fine. Could, any, could everybody else see it? It's, uh, it's, uh, Boone's website. Can you guys see it? I know sometimes when you switch over it, uh, it acts up. Yeah. Let's just get okay. a simple yes from one person. Yep, yep. we're good. Uh, okay, we're good. So now everybody is typing it. <laughs> okay, so this is this is my lighting folio. Uh, so I mentioned before, I really don't enjoy modeling much. I'm not particularly good at it. So it didn't. I still set out to do lighting and I looked for scenes, uh, often finding photographs that I like and I'd take something from the photograph and I'd reproduce it. But I look for things that are simple and quick for me to model, simple and quick to texture because they're things I don't particularly, I, I enjoy texturing a bit, but I don't, I don't love it. Uh, and just get straight to the lighting. So yes, Naughty Dog hired me on this. They also had a test, which uh, I should emphasize is really important because uh, the test is critical to getting into the interview and stuff. But, uh, these scenes, you can see like these uh, these columns, they're just more or less cylinders. I put a displacement map on them. I've, I found some photos online and photo bashed them really quickly. These rocks are just black gloss. There is no texture on them at all. And it's the same rock, just copied and pasted over and over. You know, there's a slight noise. I think I use a photo of clouds to create some noise on the water. So it gave that sense that the water was slightly in motion. I mean, this uh, sci-fi hallway, who hasn't done a sci-fi hallway? Everybody should do a sci-fi hallway. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just the same basic. I modeled a couple of panels and I copied and pasted them. Again, it was like spend as little time doing the stuff you don't like as possible so that you can get to the bits you do. So this one is it's cubes, right? I mean, these are literally cubes with a slightly beveled edge and I threw a concrete texture on it, tiles. Uh, the grass was a little bit more complex. I mean, I, but again, I, I was looking for quick ways to do this stuff. I had an idea in my head. So I created some paint effects grass in Maya, converted it to polys and used a scatter plugin to scatter it all over the place randomly. That was it. There's no attention to detail in that. I just let it be whatever it is and I focus on the lighting. Um, uh, some experimental stuff. Sometimes stuff pops into my head. I listen to all the retro, retro wave like laser hawk and stuff like that. So I get all nerdy about that. You know, I, again, see, even the, the lighting in this is not particularly good. Uh, the grade isn't good, but it was an experiment, and I kind of liked the, the graphic quality of it, so I, so I posted this one to my folio. I, so I have lots and lots of these, and not all of them are su successful, but I learned something from every single one of them, and that's, that's critical. I mean, but there is not a single one of these where the modeling is complicated. It's done very quickly. I mean, this is, this is literally spheres with a noise displacement you can see there's two spheres there that are kind of overlapping each other I'd... some more pat and stuff this, i think this is this one's my favorite another beautiful one it's it's uh i wish i had the scene handy to show you but this is uh, a textured sphere with a bunch of little spheres randomly placed inside it so they look like bubbles and some floorboards with a slight dip in the wood so focusing on that on getting some of the detail in there but they're, most of it's texture and lighting and heavy See, depth of field. And I'm sorry, Boone, uh, could you could you pause on that for a sec? I think, yeah, for sure. and, and this is something I forgot to mention yesterday. It's like, you know, um, yes, if you had a very elaborate scene, right? You know, it's like with these crazy textures and everything and all this detail, it's like, you know, yes, it's like, you know, you would do a great job with it. But I think one of the things though, that's really effective about something so simple as the scene is it really allows you to just focus on the lighting, right? Absolutely. You're not focusing, you're not focusing on a crazy ZBrush detail, you know, in the character, 
you know, it's like, you know, all the elements in the scene and all the different type of materials and like, you know, the different type of shaders or whatever. It's like, you're really forced to just focus on the simplicity of it. And in this case, it's all lighting. Yeah, that's it's right. All there's, lighting. So I, I mean, there there's a little bit of material work. That. Uh, yeah. because lighting and materials interact with each other hand, so yeah. much, but, but yeah, it's, I mean, the, this, so my real, this is I thing I mentioned to you before, you know, like an illustrator will take a sketchbook out at lunch and they'll sit there and they'll sketch people walking past. This is, this is a lighting artist's version of that. You find these really simple scenes and they're experimental and you, you reproduce the scene and get the most pure thing you can out of it, which is try to sell a look with light alone as much as possible. Yeah. Uh, because the reality is if you've got these big complicated environments, they're unwieldy and they're difficult to handle. If, you, if you've ever had to light map unwrap a scene like that, and I have, you're looking at weeks of just doing that just before you can even start lighting. So focus on the things that just let you light quickly. Like uh, uh, this hallway, there's, Beautiful. so, so th again, attention to detail is pretty important. So in this hallway, the walls are all just a simple shader, but I chipped a little bit of, kind of paint off the corners and this st this stuff helps a lot so if you're working on a folio and you want to create these simple spaces add adding these little details really sells suddenly that it's photorealistic and uh i think my favorite personal one might be this one uh this took me maybe uh, i think less than 10 minutes to model Seriously, I just threw some cubes in. I had an idea for an image. I think I might have seen a photograph that was similar. I'm like, okay, I'm going to reproduce that. I really like that. And uh, it was uh, there's a sun in there. There's no sky dome. I used some area lights to kind of really get the composition I wanted out of it. Uh, convert it to black and white. Voila, it looks better already because it's black and white. Pro tip, cool cheat, go for that. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, this is, I mean, this is the kind of stuff that I play with a lot. So yes, this got me hired by Naughty Dog, this and my, uh, and my test. So. No, oh, beautiful stuff. And as I said, it's, uh, it's just a testament to, you know, really focusing on your craft, as you said, you know, so. Yeah. Um, please don't let the, a lack of complicated environments stop yeah. you because really yeah. that's, uh, it, it, your lighting should be able to sell itself. There's a, something about lighting, which I've. I love, and that's that you can light a a white cube in a white box and make it look so pretty you'll want to print it and hang it on your wall. But you can also light the most complicated, detailed, beautiful environment and make it look like turd. So, yeah. I mean, it's there's a lot of power in lighting and there's a lot of responsibility. Please don't let the lack of really complicated environments stop you from becoming a lighting artist. Cool. No. Great one. So, um, Ali, thanks for that question because uh, it was a great segue into uh, into something that you know we really I wanted everybody to see because as I said it was a true testament to just the quality um, and just not just the quality but just uh, well the quality of just you, your artwork right um, and your understanding of lighting because um, I get asked by students all the time, hey, it's like you know I want to focus on lighting but I don't have an amazing you know scene to light you know. And in this well, case, I, I think the reality is you're going to suck at it like a hundred, a thousand times before you're good, right? So yeah. get those, get those a hundred or thousand really shitty versions of your art out of the way as quickly as possible, so you can start being good at it. Don't, yeah. don't, don't take forever modeling an environment because it's going to take you forty years to get through the hundred to a thousand shitty versions of it. Exactly, completely agree. So, um, what work, uh, Alexi? Um, wants to know uh, what workstation are you using for, for lighting? Uh, do you have any of the specs for the workstation at work or? I don't, unfortunately. I mean, it's, I don't think it's anything particularly amazing. It's a consumer level PC as far as I know. Uh, yeah, I mean, I work, I do this stuff at home as well on a $500 PC, so. Yeah, cool. Um, Roman wants to know, um, do you have any advice about how to tackle exposure? Oh, okay. Uh, that's an interesting one. So er, we all approach it differently. Exposure is really important because light values are more or less arbitrary, right? Like if your sun is 10 or if your sun is 10,000, it doesn't really matter. It, uh, your exposure will kind of push into the range that it needs to go. I tend to approach uh, that a cloudy sky is exposure zero. So that's that's a good place for me to start so that I don't get too far. I, I kind of have a 
common dialogue then between all of my levels. I know that every level I can look at this level and say, okay, well, this is a sunny day that you're looking at right now. So my exposure point is probably minus three, minus four, something like that. Like I'm exposing down a little because it's a bright sunny day. Uh, our software uses a, a kind of dynamic iris. So it looks for bright points in the scene and it looks for dark points and it figures out, I don't know how this works, by the way, I'm just kind of winging this. I don't know how it works uh, in the code. But I know that I can choose a I can choose an exposure point. I can choose an exposure range. So I can say the camera can go down to minus two and up to plus one, but it can't kind of deviate outside that range. And we'll set up regions throughout a level to change that. So so in the prison, which you're looking at right now, this was a challenging level for this because it had some parts that were exposed down to minus four and some parts were up to plus six. So you're talking about 10 stops of exposure. So in the interiors, I would have separate render settings that that clamped those exposure ranges so it wouldn't yo-yo too much. It wouldn't go too high or too low. Uh, and then we'd like do some scripting so that as you walked through a doorway, it would slowly kind of blend up to a different exposure or down to a different exposure. So so there's definitely a lot of work on that. It's not something you you casually dial in and then ignore. Cool. Um, JJ, uh, Unreal 4 has capsule shadows for indirect casting. Looking at the prison scene, it looks like you still get nice soft shadows inside the indirect um, illuminated areas. Do you use cheats to get um, effects that are limited by real time? Or can you achieve more natural lighting through post processes? Uh, I'm sorry, I can't really answer that question with a great deal of detail. I know that uh, that Naughty Dog developed some ca some capsule, uh, I, I don't even know what we call it, but uh, some shadowing technology for uh, The Last of Us, I believe. And it was when what you're talking about, when you walk up against a wall and that wall is only indirectly lit, you still get a sense of contact shadow from the character. We still use that same technology and it does create really nice results. So it's... Uh, as the player is walking through an environment, you will get these soft, subtle kind of uh, shadows that give you the sense that this baked indirect light is actually dynamic. Uh, I, I have, sorry, I have no idea how that is implemented. Cool. Uh, not a worry. Um, how has you, um, how has technology changed your process? More freedom? JJ wants to know. More iteration time. Uh, early on when I was working on Animalia, which is not, a particularly uh, technically impressive feat. It's uh, it's looks like an old school CGI animated TV series, which is exactly what it is. Uh, a render could take days, so being able to tweak your rim light and your bake, your sun direction and all this kind of stuff uh, with technology that allows me to turn a bake around in twenty minutes. That is, that's the big thing. I mean, the, it's really cool that the technology got better and I could get better results faster and the shaders look better and all of this kind of stuff. But mostly when I'm thinking in terms of as an artist who wants to add 20 lights to a scene and move them around and make things look pretty, it's the ability to do that as quickly as possible. And it's something we focus on at work a lot. We, we constantly develop new tools and new workflows and improve the technology in a way that allows us to rapidly iterate. We can iterate faster. I think that's that's the most critical thing is being able to make changes because none of us land on a successful result right away. I wish I could show you what my what my first pass lighting looks like on most of these levels. <laughs> no, I don't. Actually, there's no way I'd show anybody. Yeah. I'd like no. die of shame. Yeah. <laughs> so um, Brandon wants to know as a lighter, are you in charge of screen effects like AO, clutter, et cetera? Um, or do you work closely with effects artists uh, that manage um, fog that affect lighting as well. And, and that wasn't clutter. It was just C L U T clut. Okay. Uh, yes. And yes, I mean, I, I do have control over pretty much everything about the final look and of the scene. So that does include quite a lot of effects type stuff. Uh, but yes, we also work collaboratively. So, so I have a control over say universal fog on the scene, but then I might talk to uh, one of the FX artists and say, hey, it'd be really cool if we had this drifting fog on the ground here, uh, which the FX artist might say, yeah, I agree. And they'll create it and we'll test it and we'll iterate and we go backwards and forwards. It's very, very collaborative and vice versa. I mean, the, someone will come to me and say, hey, I really like this lighting in this space, but what if you move this light over here and we put this kind of effect here instead? And we, we do that. We try that. So, 
No, that's great. Um, so Basim Morcos, and I'm sorry for butchering your name, Basim. Um, as a lighting artist at Naughty Dog, are you responsible for creating the UV map for, for light maps? Obviously, I know you answered that before, but if you could go in a little bit of detail. Oh my God, thank God, no. I, I, <laughs> light map unwrapping is the worst. I apologize to everybody who has to do it. I, I had to do it for my test. <laughs> it's, it's not a fun process. Uh, I guess it can be a little bit cathartic in the sense that you just zone out for 18 hours moving UVs around. But uh, we actually, we have tools that, uh, that auto unwrap some things, but our, unfortunately our background artists, the poor folks have to, uh, have to do light map unwraps of a lot of stuff. So cool. that doesn't, that doesn't fall on us. Thank God. Okay. okay. I, I'm smiling from ear to ear. I feel a little bit <laughs> evil with this grin on my face, but seriously, I'm glad we don't have to do that. <laughs> um, do you write much HLSL? Um, shader code yourself? None. Uh, I definitely want to. I want to learn it. It's. Uh, I think this is, as a lighting artist, or probably as any role in the industry, skilling up in other areas is really useful. So, for example, I taught myself uh, programming. It took me quite a while because I, I'm not super technical, and I'd come home and I'd spend two hours a night staring at code to try and learn what the hell it was saying and wait for those plateau moments where suddenly something clicks. But learning that, was absolutely worth it because now I can go to work and there's something that I'm doing that's a laborious process. And I think, you know what, I can write a script to do this. I can write a small program that automates this. And then I've improved the workflow for me and improved the workflow for the team. In the same way, if you want to learn HLSL as a lighting artist, I think that's amazing. I think that's a really powerful thing to know because you're going to know how you're using the tools to create art, but you're also going to have some skills that allow you to adjust the, the techniques that art, that art is rendered. So you might, so for me, if I have an idea, for example, I might think, you know what, I think our reflections could look better if they did this, then that process is slowed a little for me because I need to go find someone who's, who also agrees with my idea and is willing to take the time to test it and see what, and again, I mean, tests like that uh, fail more often than they, than they succeed, but we do, we always try this kind of stuff. But if I could do that myself, jump in and write some HLSL co code and, test it and see if it how how it worked out i think that'd be amazing so I, it's definitely something i want to learn cool. um carl wants to know are you hand okay nope that's the exact same uh same question so i guess uh that was answered um bo john did you use v-ray or similar uh render for your portfolio work or was it unreal or unity uh, okay, so my portfolio stuff is all offline rendered. So it's all V-Ray, Mental Ray, uh, some, uh, a little bit of Render Man, uh, some Maya software. It's, it's kind of whatever works. Uh, learning the, the process is more important than the renderer. So I'm a fan of V-Ray because V-Ray allows me to get very quick, decent results. So I can kind of get to the you know, depending on the scene, so like a nice exterior, I can get 80% of the way in V-Ray really quickly. But ultimately, I, I'm an artist, not a technician. So I'm going to look at that scene. I'm going to want to get in and, you know, tweak those values and move some lights around and add some extra lights to kick certain parts of the scene. And that works regardless of your renderer. You know, I, I even recommend you try to light scenes. So take a take a photograph, a simple photograph, produce a simple model of it and try to light it the same way in Maya software. You know, use, a, use area lights to fake bounce light. This kind of stuff I, I think is really useful because it never goes away. I'm still using those same techniques even now. In this room that you're looking at right now and these interiors, there are a lot of area lights in there that just fake extra fill or extra bounce or, you know, kind of kick certain parts of the scene. And all of that comes from, I think, well, my, my, my skills with that come from back in the day having to render with renderers that didn't do this stuff automatically. So... That's a skill set that's worth learning. Cool. Uh, and uh, Justina wants to know, how often do you go back and forth between people in different departments? You said polishing a turd. Um, did you ever have to tell someone to change anything because the light wasn't working well with the scene? Oh, geez. Um, I mean, 
I, I, I hate that phrase being applied to what <laughs> to what I'm talking about now because that implies that that anyone I've worked with at Naughty Dog has ever produced a turd. <laughs> That's just not the case. Uh, but but there's there's definitely a lot of back and forth. I mean, uh, so Christian Nakata is the amazing environment artist responsible for these interiors, and uh, I mean, there's his I I got great results from his stuff straight away. But but we kind of we're super nitpicky, you know, so we'll go in and I'll go, I'll, I will say to him, you know what I, the, you know, the green on the walls is like 3% too saturated. I think anyway, what do you think? And he's like, he might say, oh no, you're completely wrong. Or he might say, you know what, I, let's try it and see how it looks and we'll try it. And it's very collaborative. We all work together. Uh, it's very important not to be precious. You've, you've got to accept that you're producing something that is a team effort and, uh, knowing when to trust your own gut and when to step back a bit and say, you know what, I, I'm going to try that, or I think you're right. Let's give it a go is, is really important. But yeah, there's, uh, so I've never had to polish a turd at Naughty Dog. <laughs> God, I'm going to regret saying that someone at work's going to jump on me for that. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, there's, there's definitely back and forth and not just me going to somebody and saying, Hey, the, can you, can you tweak these materials? I think they'll work better with the lighting, but there's people coming to me and saying, Hey, the lighting's too bright here. It's too dark here. Uh, I want to be able to see this. My material isn't showing any spec. How do I fix the spec on this or how do you fix it? And I'll go, yeah, no worries. I'll, I'll jump in and see what I can do with that. So I uh, might do something like, you know, add some, and here's, it goes back to a question about PBR and keeping as realistic as possible. So something that I'm a huge fan of is adding specular only runtime lights. So I'll add a point light. It doesn't cast any shadows. It just emits specular. And I might put it in a hallway or put it in a dark area so that the surfaces appear slightly more specular. They have some more reflectivity to them. Uh, and that's where the art process steps in on top of the PBR type stuff. But yeah, there's definitely a lot of collaboration. Cool. Uh, what, are, what do you think are the most important skills for uh, a 3D lighting artist? Um, Orkan wants to know. Uh, to be able to light well? <laughs> I, I, um... <laughs> Sorry, that was that was a, a cheeky response, but I, I mean, I, I would say that you need to be able to bridge the science, the technology, and the art. So you're gonna want to know the science of light. Uh, Jeremy Vickery has done some training. He's a ex Pixar guy. He now works at Naughty Dog. He's done that's some, amazing. Yeah, he's done some great Such lighting creators. training on the science of light, and that's really good. Uh, I'll also be covering this in my course. So. Uh, it's critical to understand how light moves through a scene and how it reacts with materials and uh, the difference between diffuse and indirect and specular and uh, roughness and all of these things. Uh, the second step is the technology, understanding how the technology emulates these things because you want to know how you can improve that when you need to, how you can cheat it, how you can break the rules and the limitations. So you might want to create a scene that has this very specific look, but the technology doesn't quite do that right. So how do you go about uh, using the tools that you have at your disposal to produce that result? And the last one is the art. So you need to watch a lot of films, uh, follow a lot of photographers, look at their stuff, Take screen grabs from a film, model that scene in the most simple way, and try to reproduce the light. I think I think it all just comes from that. I wish I could give you a a basic checklist of stuff that you could focus on. Oh, also learn some scripting. I think scripting is useful for every single department. So I would say learn some Python scripting. That's going to help a lot. But otherwise, just get in there and start lighting stuff and challenging yourself and making lots and lots of mistakes. Because when you make mistakes, you learn lots of cool stuff. Cool, and I think that answers Jeff's question, which is you mentioned um, you mentioned the science of light. Uh, could you go into more detail on how you could learn more about that and develop an eye for what looks real or not? So you answered that question as well. Yeah. So perfect. Um, so SM wants to know: Do you handle? And I think you've mentioned that a little bit, but do you handle the shaders as well as the lights, or is that um, mainly on the environment artists? Uh, I rarely touch the shaders, though sometimes uh, I can, I can jump in. So so it depends. I mean, no one, no one wants to step into somebody else's domain and do their work. You know, uh, I definitely have input on the materials and how they respond to light. Maybe they, some might be too dark for the look we're going for, some might be too light or stuff like that. 
But uh, from time to time, I'll jump in, especially if it's like emissive surfaces, there's a light bulb on the wall and it's emitting uh, a glow. And I, I'll just edit the material because it's quicker for me to do it than to go to the artist. And also, I, they, they, they're not going to mind if I do that. But often, so I'll go into a scene with a very clear view of what I want from the scene, but so is the environment artist. So I don't want to take that from them. So that's why we collaborate so much. But if you are in control of the lighting and the materials, you can have a lot of power, but uh, it's, it can be, it's a lot to learn as well. These are two entirely different fields that are super, super correlated. Cool. Um, Sarah wanted to know how long, um, were you given to complete, uh, the tests? Uh, as long as I needed. Hmm. That's, I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but the test for me was as long as I needed. I'm not sure what the test rules are now. Uh, it's been two years since I did the test and I think they update them fairly frequently, but yeah, I, I mean, I took, I, I, as long as I needed and I took as long as I needed. Cool. Um, Okay, Carl has a question. Are you hand UVing light maps? I know we no, we already answered that. No, we're not doing that yet. Yep, we already answered that. Um, JJ, did you have any prior game experience before applying at Naughty Dog? Uh, it seems like every every um, game gig wants AAA experience before applying. You're okay. I, I didn't I can, have much. <laughs> no, I can talk about that. I mean, I worked at I worked at Chrome, uh, which was an independent studio and it's uh that was quite a while ago and then the i i worked on a couple of projects there um but i mean to be but honest AAA, I bet, no nothing triple a i mean i i loved chrome as a studio but they they weren't a big triple a producer and the last thing i worked on before i applied at naughty dog was an ios game a fruit ninja educational game for five-year-olds so <laughs> i mean i uh, the reality is can i tell a story about my interview I think that oh, might. Oh, I think if, if it's a story I think uh, you mentioned, please do. Okay, so so something I think is really critical, and maybe not every studio works this way. Maybe every studio is going to come at you and want a big list of credits. But uh, I I got to the interview with Naughty Dog, and I wasn't really sure why they'd brought me over, to be honest. But I hey, I got a free flight to LA, my first time out of Australia, so that was really cool. So I. Uh, I went into the interview and they kind of took a look at my work and they asked me a bunch of questions and I felt profoundly insecure. I was like, what the hell am I doing here? You are naughty dog. This is the, the pinnacle and I haven't, I've barely scratched the surface in what I do. But they, I mean, they said they liked my work. They liked the look of my work and they asked me a question and said, why did I want to work at naughty dog? And I started to answer one of those kind of, you know, those canned answers, you know, oh, because you do the best video games in the world and because your stories are so good and because your art is so good. Uh, but it was inauthentic. So I, because there was a reason and the reason was I am a big hairy old gay man and uh, I played The Last of Us. And when you meet Bill, the first thing that popped into my head was he's a daddy bear. This is a gay character, and I just knew it straight away. My gut told me that this was a gay character, and so I looked around his apartment and I saw the uh, the gay porn mags piled up in his his bookshelf, and I was so excited. I thought, "Holy crap! Here's a gay character who isn't cr a creepy rapist, and isn't a like a a punchline to a joke. He isn't he isn't a stereotype. He's just this interesting kind of gruff and ultimately really tragic character. And the way they handled his his character." was super sensitive and I I loved the story of him and so here I am in the interview telling this story jet lagged and I started bawling like just completely crying at the table I'm like oh god just just tell me I'm not hired now like I'm a complete mess and and uh one of the interviewers I won't say his name one of the significant interviewers just just got up and left so I was like oh god I'm like I've ruined this I've destroyed it but I heard that he walked out of the room and said yep hire him you know like they I, I was hired I think because, uh, as I understand it, they kind of liked what I brought along. So I bought something different. It was, I I was just myself when I went in, which was the hardest thing in the world to do because you kind of want to overthink it and you want to present yourself as, as this super successful thing. But I wasn't. I, I didn't have the experience. I was pretty confident I was a, an okay lighter and I knew I would get better at Naughty Dog because I'd have no choice. I know my personality is to, you know, I'm going to have to step up here. And it's true. I've, I mean, I've done the best work I've ever done at Naughty Dog and I can improve a lot more still. And that's the most fascinating and wonderful thing to me. But ultimately, I was hired because 
I I came in passionate and all super interested and I was just genuine about it. There was there was nothing fake about it. And I've heard stories of other people being hired there uh, ahead of really, really experienced people because the people doing the interviewing really liked who they were. And I think that I, I believe that probably applies across the board more than you think it does. So, so when someone, my experience, I, I can't talk for Naughty Dog's hiring procedures, right? Like it's, I, I really don't know. I can only talk anecdotally about my experience. Uh, but in my experience, when a company is advertising for someone with experience, they just want to know that you can do the job. And if you can prove that you can do good work, regardless of your of your experience level uh there's there might be some question can they can you work in a production environment i mean that's because production environments are very different than sitting at home and working on your own stuff which is a fair concern but after after they make that decision like can you do the work can you can you fit in the team can you produce the next question is do we want to work with you and part of that is like just being a nice, interesting, authentic human being who has something to offer, especially if you can bring who you are, because who you are is going to be very different to who everybody else is. Cool. No, that's a great story. And, and obviously, people really enjoy that story, getting some comments on that now. But um, yeah, I remember the first time you told me. I nearly started crying again. <laughs> I, yeah. get, I get really emotional <laughs> when I talk about it. <laughs> no, it's a powerful story. And it's definitely a testament, you know, to just your passion, you know. Um, so, and, and, and Naughty Dog, obviously seeing some, someone that was just genuine, passionate, and obviously a great artist. So. There is, there is not enough that can be said about being authentic and passionate, right? Like yeah. just, just be who you are. You're going to bring something unique and exactly. d don't sweat what you can't control. You can't control that you don't have a lot of experience. So stop worrying about it. Just go and get better at what you do. You can't fix that by worrying about it, right? Just be yeah. better. Like exactly. get better every day. And, and speaking of that, it's um, someone was wanting uh, wanted to know. Um, Yakov wanted to know. Could you please cycle through the uh, images from uh, your audition again? And um, obviously, she's referring. He's referring to the uh, the images from your portfolio. For sure, I'm happy to do that. Let's yeah, go definitely. back there. And as we're doing that, um, um, Bojana wants to know how do you balance baked versus dynamic lighting? How many dynamic lights are used in the scene? And what do you use to, uh, what do you, well, we already know there's no light maps, <laughs> you know. You're not okay. So, so how many dynamic lights do I use? Yeah. Uh, how long is a piece of string? It, it yeah. depends on us. <laughs> so in some scenes, uh, I will I use. I would say for this opportunity, let's switch back to, uh, for this particular question, and then we could go back to this, but let's switch back to uh, your, uh, your um, Uncharted work. Yeah, let's uh, let's have a look because I might be able to use an example. So this scene has zero runtime lights uh, except for the sun. Okay, so this is all baked, and uh, uh, I'm a, FYI, I'm a huge fan of baked lighting. I think uh, baked lighting gives me so much control over the look. I, it, yep, it has its limitations, right? Like with games are getting more and more dynamic, and uh, we we constantly facing that challenge of how to integrate. Uh, dynamic elements with baked lighting, but it's something worth solving to me because I really like the power and the fidelity that you get from baked lighting. But so there's there's a sun in this scene. Uh, uh, again, this scene is just the sunlight. Uh, this scene is a this scene had about 20 runtime lights in it, so it has uh, a fake sunlight shining through the window, casting some volumetric kind of crepuscular rays i think they're called what a weird name it sounds like a disease Man, no. crepuscular rays uh there's lights just to cast some so if you look at the globe i'm going to freeze that if you look at the globe on the right of the screen there's a slight blue highlight on the center of that globe now i think that's coming from there's a point light non-shadow casting spec point runtime light that's just picking up some reflections on surfaces uh Again, I think this one is mostly just baked. I mean, we uh, we do some magic trickery sometimes so that we can bake the background. Uh, so the lights in the stairwell, uh, the astute among you will notice that the the pattern of the lighting on the walls does not match the sconce at all. But but you know what? It looked good, so I, I left it there. Uh, and a lot of this will come down to your, your artistic choices. But so the light on the stairwell is hitting the walls and it's baked to the walls, but there's a runtime light that affects the character only as they walk under that light. So uh, it's not always 
super accurate, but it's about selling it. So what feels right and what feels good. And if you really look closely, sometimes you'll see the cracks where those things don't always line up, but but no one cares about that stuff, right? They just want something that looks really nice and that they can that say, wow, that's pretty. And oh, my character feels like they're integrated in the space. So this room, uh, we, use, we use light probe data to light the characters with ambient light and there was mostly ambient light hitting in this room but i found when the character walked against the windows that they kind of lit a bit strange because of the way the the ambient light was working on those probes so what i did was the window the lights at the windows there's some area lights in these windows pushing in some extra soft blue fill light into the room i made them affect the background only so they didn't affect any of the light probe data and now I put runtime lights in the windows, spotlights that just affect the character. So as you get close to the windows, the character gets much better fidelity because runtime lights are gonna give you really nice shadows and really nice specularity. Uh, but obviously they have a real performance cost. So we have to be careful about how many we use. Some scenes I can use 50 of the things because the scene is small and there's just not that much uh, uh, material density or not that much physics going on or whatever else costs has a cost to the scene. Some scenes are so expensive that I can't use any runtime lights at all. So, uh, and that's going to come back to uh, a lot of back and forth between all of the various departments to get it feeling right. Now, the interior of this work shed, there's a runtime light at uh, every single window. Uh, and some spaces I used, uh, so if we go back to, I'm trying to find the, that one. So back to this, uh, again, the background is baked, but there's also runtime lights hitting the background and the characters. So the character shadows don't go completely dark here, uh, which I didn't mind the look of that. It felt like there was a little bit of diffuse light getting into the shadows. Uh, but I separated the volumetric from the key light. So you can see the volumetric lights coming down through those holes in the ceiling. Uh, there's two lights at each of those, it's three, sorry. There's a, there's a spotlight that's emitting a key light only, so diffuse only light, which I controlled independently of another spotlight that was emitting the volumetrics. And I put a gobo on that to get a shape to the volumetric effect. And then there's a point light, which is emitting spec only. So I get specular on the, you can see the spec on the pipes on the wall and uh, so, some spec in the floor. So by separating those out, I lose some, physical accuracy, but I get more control. So I was able to tweak the spec to where I wanted it, the the key to where I wanted it, and the volume to where I wanted it all independently of each other. Cool. And uh, Roman just clarified that the, uh, what is it, the uh, crepes, crepuscula? Yeah, crepuscula is actually, uh, it means dusk in Italian. Oh, there you go. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I did not know that. Thank you. I, I've, I've just learned something as a lighting artist. That's wonderful. Thank you so much. So, um, so okay. Well, that sounds way prettier now. I'm like, no, okay, that's a pretty word. It's just, it, it, just, it sounded like something to like that might grow on a plant or something. I wasn't yeah, too sure. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Your, your plant is diseased with, uh, crepuscolo or something. So yes. So um, now it's a very pretty word. Thank you exactly. so much. Exactly. So if we could still stay on, on those. Oh, back on the, back on the uncharted. Um, yeah. Yeah. We just wanted, uh, someone wanted to know how long does it take, um, for you to light some of these scenes? I know it, it probably varies from scene to scene, but if you could give us a couple of uh, benchmarks for how long it takes to light some of these scenes. It took all of them two years. <laughs> no, I mean, <laughs> I, I, I worked on all of the scenes from start to finish, more or less. So I jump backwards and forwards between the scenes. It's hard to say exactly how long some took. Some definitely took more work than others. Uh, I, the, these levels, these came together fairly quickly. I was pretty happy with the results early, long, early on inside the tower here. Uh, the tunnel, I had four or five iterations on this before I started to settle on something. The exterior here was a, another quick one. The one I probably spent the most, the two I spent the most time on were the townhome, uh, which is a complicated interior. There's a lot of different lighting happening in here. There's, uh, it, I, it had to look a certain way too. I mean, the story here is that uh, Drake is, he's kind of settled down from his adventures and it's before he kicks off his new adventure. And we didn't want it to feel too cozy, right? Like he he's supposed to feel like, uh, you know, he's kind of craving his adventurous lifestyle again. But when I looked at this apartment, I'm like, I would kill to live in this house. So <laughs> I, it was it was tricky to make it both warm, which I so saw up, up top. This is where all of his memories are. So this is the warmest place. This is the nicest place. Uh, this took the most work was the attic. 
uh, getting this feeling just right. So it feels a little bit uh, nostalgic. It feels a little bit dusty and uh, cozy. Like I would go into this room and I'd sit down and I'd read a book because it feels really, really comfortable. But then moving down, I kind of went for a bit more harsher lighting and the, the shadows get a little bit darker. So it doesn't feel too welcoming. You know, uh, this so this one took probably, I would say, it's it's hard to put the number down. I would say I'd spent probably about uh, a quarter of my time on the entire game on this level, getting this one feeling right because this this felt really important. It was a very story based level. Half the game I spent on this. So this this level I went backwards and forwards to it forever. I just kept coming back to it, trying to get it to feel just right. Uh, there was something about it because this is. Uh, it's the last scene you ever see in Uncharted. And as someone who'd never worked on a AAA game and Uncharted is one of my hands down all time favorite series. And I just started at Naughty Dog and I just moved to the US and I'm living in LA and I talk a weird accent no one understands. And they throw me this level. And I'm like, holy crap. Uh, I better not fuck this one up. So I spent a lot of time on this. And my, my reasoning for this was, well, I, I knew it had to feel really inviting so very sunny and kind of beachy and nice so that was part of the vibe but the other part was this felt like it was real to me like this was this is where drake's life suddenly gets very real he's and and happy and nice you know all these great adventures very big pulpy action movie kind of adventures and here he is in this wonderful very real place with the people he loves so that's why I kind of went for this photorealism. I really wanted it to really push the sense that this is where he lives now and this is his home and it's a wonderful, happy, welcoming place for him to be. So I spent half of my overall time on Uncharted 4 working on this level. And cool. that's that was like tweaking down to the most minor detail. I, crazy amount of focus on this one which oh, looks... maybe uh, to be perfectly honest please tune out anyone from work that's listening because i'm going to get fired for saying this maybe to the detriment of other levels i mean there were other parts of the game that i could have spent more time on and they would look better because i'd spent more time on them but ultimately it's a transaction what do i i have x hours i need to spend these hours somehow how am i going to spend them all right well this is a tunnel you walk through and you spend 30 seconds in this tunnel it could look better, but you know what? This 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 pinnacle moment needs to look amazing. So yeah. I'm gonna get this. I'm gonna get this stuff looking good, and I'll come back to it. But right now, I'm gonna go spend that time. Yeah, I think you made the right choice. <laughs> cool, man. Um, so JJ wants to know: Have you tried uh, Redshift? I have not. Sorry. Okay. Um, and SM wants to know: Does the engine handles uh, GI? Uh, do we have any runtime GI? No, yeah. no, we have no runtime GI. All of our all of our lighting is baked and using light probe data for for uh, foreground. Okay, um, Carl wants to know to that question: Are you doing your lighting setup in Maya rather than a proprietary editor? Yes. Yep. All of my lighting is done in Maya. Okay. Cool. Um, and speaking of just time frame and how long a lot of these scenes took you, um, Eric do wants to know. Uh, what is the workload like at Naughty Dog for a lighter? Uh, I mean, it varies. I, sometimes, sometimes it's pretty cruisy, and I'm, uh, you know, I have a lot of time to explore ideas in a scene. And sometimes something comes in pretty hot, and it's got to be lit and done. So, uh, it's it's a creative studio. I it's I I don't think that this is. Uh, I think this is part of the energy of the place that makes it thrive is that these things do kind of change fairly rapidly and some things do come in hot and some things come in cool and you got time to work on them. It's just part of my job. So I, uh, I certainly don't dislike it, but I, of course I would like to have two years to work on every single room in this house. You know, <laughs> That would be great. I, there's something at some point you've got to give up, give up your baby and send it out into the world. And you're always a little bit annoyed that it might be a little bit buck toothed, you know, but you do your best. To get yeah, it out there. exactly. Um, Annie wants to know what are some of the games that inspire you, uh, you know, uh, graphic lighting wise. Wow, that's a that's a great question. Um, I I honestly tend to look at for most of my lighting reference, I look at film or photography. Uh, I I think you can't beat the vast history of cinema in lighting because we're more or less doing the same thing in games. It's just a different 
different challenges and different uh, different technology and different tools. But ultimately, what we're doing is creating cinematic images, and we're using a language that an audience has already be, been familiar with. We all grew up watching movies and TV shows, and there's things like rim lights, you know, backlighting, that kind of stuff in the real world might seem a bit weird and fake if you saw it. But we're, we've we've been well trained in that vocabulary. So I tend to get most of my stuff from there. But one of the games that stands out to me as having just gorgeous lighting was the the Wolfenstein game that came out uh, a couple of years ago. I can't even remember the name of it now. It was, uh, oh, what was it? It was the, it was the Wolfenstein reboot. I, but that game, I just had some beautiful lighting and it had some really cool stuff in there that I, so this was a bit of an eye opener for me. I, I remember you get into the, the secret base and I walked into this kind of living area and there was this beautiful warm light. That's it. Yeah. And there was this beautiful warm light in this room and I looked for the light source and there was no light source. So the artist just knew that it would look beautiful to have this warm light there. So they put the light there and they didn't worry about the fact that there was no source for that light. And that to me, I had some OCD with that for a while. Like I would get really bugged. I'd be like, oh, I, I don't want to, you know, I want light here, but there's no light source. What am I going to do with that? And then ultimately, again, that's another language of cinema that, you know, you're, you're running through a dark forest at night and there's a giant blue spotlight shining on you. You know, like that, that light's not coming from anywhere but we, we're trained in that language. So learning to let go of this need to have everything feel really realistic and grounded was a challenge for me. But uh, I think they did amazingly in that Wolfenstein game. That's I, that's the one that really jumps out to me. I, I, I'm looking at my game list now and I'm trying to find something else that really stands out. I think Blizzard do amazing lighting work. I mean, they're very stylized, but they have a kind of consistent look. I love the lighting in Diablo. Uh Bloodborne, I think Bloodborne has beautiful lighting. It's it's very kind of uh, very bleak and desolate, and really sets the mood. Uh, Destiny, I I think Destiny has some really cool tech going on in Destiny. I mean, they keep keep the frame rate really high and have these beautiful open spaces and wonderful color palettes. Uh, yeah, I think there's there's some really good lighting out there that I that I definitely appreciate. But I get most of my reference from film and photography cool um how do you get good looking fluid real-time renders fluids okay cool so uh so most of the look of a fluid it depends right I, I, like uh so some fluid effects are handled by effects exclusively like dripping water and stuff like that but fluid surfaces like puddles and stuff like that uh we're just trying to sell the effect of wetness. So it's all about the specularity on the surface. Now, I, I don't have a lot of control over that. The material artist will deal with like the the surface tension and where where the surface of the puddle will kind of give way to wet concrete and then dry concrete. And uh, there's some really cool math and shader work that goes into getting that looking realistic. Basically, I deal with the specularity of those surfaces by putting cube maps in, and sometimes I cheat them. So sometimes I'll make those cube maps really, uh, really physically inaccurate, just so you get this really nice shimmer in a puddle as you walk past. Cool. Um, how do you take uh, the attention of the player to a point in a fluid and natural way? And 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 other way to phrase it, it's like you know, how do you guide um, a player's, um, you know, how do you guide a player through the game? Um, with lighting or through lighting? Contrast. Uh, it's all about contrast. So a player will notice a dark space in a light area or a light space in a dark area. Uh, pulling out forms. Uh, so for, for example, here you can see in this shot, you can see your eyes kind of drawn to that the end of the hallway because it gets dark. We have a light space, then a dark space, then another light space. And that contrast and those patterns create visual interest. Uh, Sometimes we, we have special challenges. Uh, I don't know, did uh, you may have all seen our reveal of the Uncharted DLC? And oh, there's yeah. it's a very dark space and there's an interior that has almost no artificial lighting and it's nighttime. So there's no natural lighting coming in the windows either. So a lot of that was using specularity to pull the player's eyes around. So putting a fake spec on a wall so that the player kind of catches some glimmer of surface there and looks at that spot. And uh, we'll play it through and we'll get other people to play it through and people will point out areas where players get lost and we go back to it and we revise. Uh, but it's all about the contrast, like having my favorite trick and it's 
such a such a cheesy trick to me it feels because I kind of do it over and over again is having a light around the corner. So you'll be in a hallway and there's a light spilling into the hallway from somewhere else. And so there's a kind of a curiosity in in me as a player. I want to know where that light is coming from. I want to know what that space looks like, uh, especially if it's casting some interesting shadows. It kind of gives you a sense, some for, foreshadowing of what is coming up. So I do this a lot. And I, I'm kind of laughing at myself because it does feel like a cheesy trick, but <laughs> it's it's my go-to solution. If you're in a spot and I, ca- and I need you to know where to go, I'm going to put a light around the corner. That's yeah. That's it. Cool. Um, and we're, we're coming up on time guys. Um, I know there's tons of questions, but, um, we're going to get a couple of more. Um, so Roman wanted to know if you, if there are any books that you could recommend. Oh, there, there are, and I can't remember the name of them any right now. Yeah. I have a stack of books on my desk and I honestly can't remember the name of any of them right now, but, uh, there's certainly books on cinematic lighting are really good. There's a handful that are, that are really well known. Uh, they they tend to deal a lot more with setting up cinematic lights. Like they get a little bit technical in ways that don't directly apply to us. But again, most of my reference comes from studying photography and cinematography. So yeah. anything on photography, anything on cinematography, literally watch a lot of films, take yeah. screenshots, look at the screenshots and figure out what, what the light is doing in those screenshots. Because in terms of actually like physically lighting, like getting your hands dirty in mire and adding lights and hitting render and stuff like that. There are some tutorials out there on YouTube, but my course will be covering a lot of that. Uh, so um, Roman recommended a uh, framed ink. I haven't heard of that one. I, I haven't heard of that one either, but I'll yeah. check it out. Yeah, I got to check that one out. So uh, speaking of your course, um, uh, we have a couple of questions for that. Um, what should someone expect to get from the course? And what type of uh, what type of uh, scenes they're going to be working on? Okay, so uh, we're going to be working on a large variety of scenes, indoor and outdoor. Uh, some diorama type spaces, so we can focus on different aspects of lighting and materials. Uh, we're going to be looking a little at what I was talking about earlier, where you can build very simple scenes and make them look super pretty. So I, I think that's a really useful thing because these. I know that it, with, there's a tendency with tutorials, at least for me, where I want to jump into a tutorial and come out with a portfolio piece. Uh, but the goal is to give you the tools that allow you to make all of your pieces for portfolio pieces. So I'll be talking about art, science, and technology, and then just practically showing examples of here's a hallway. How do how can we light this hallway? What if it's daytime? What if it's nighttime? What if uh, it has to be dark? What if it has to be light? What if the player has to navigate through this door? What if the player can't navigate through that door? What kind of things are we going to be looking at? Uh, to solve those problems. Also, I'll be talking about uh, like s- light ratios, like getting your exposure, your sun and your sky feeling really nice and sh- demonstrating how you can go for completely different aesthetics just by tweaking those values. So uh, you should definitely be able to come out of this course, whether you're an independent game developer, if you want to work in cinema, if you want to work for AAA, if you've, if you've got a game, if you've got scenes, if you're a modeler that wants to light your scenes well, uh, if you want to like cut scenes, if the, the goal Someone is to is cover all of designer. This. Yeah, for sure. You should be, yeah. I mean, this is all, all of this applies. Like it's, it's all, uh, it's all about lighting your spaces so that they look good. And I would hope that every single person coming out of this course could take that information and apply it directly to the work they're doing, whatever it is. So, because we're the last step in the pipe and unless you're working in illustrated 2d, you're going to have to deal with lighting in some way. And, uh, the goal is to give you all the tools that so whatever you go on to do, you're going to understand enough about lighting that you can take all of your hard work leading up to lighting and really showcase it with really solid lighting. Definitely. And, um, and, and I'm sorry guys for, and this, this is something that happens all the time. It's like, you know, there's just way more questions than we have time. So I'm sorry we couldn't get to all of them, but um, before, before we leave Boone, I just wanted to see if you had any, you know, just last bit of advice um, for just the audience here. Uh, Geez, I don't know. I mean, there's going to be lots and lots of technical advice that I just can't cover now. There's not enough time. But uh, (laughs) No, just advice in general. Be passionate and be interested and don't give up on it. If like some little country country boy from Australia can end up at Naughty Dog when the last thing I worked on was an iOS game, you know, like be passionate and uh, be yourself, be authentic, look for things that interest you, uh, work hard, 
please work hard. Nothing comes easily, right? Like you've, you've got to work hard. That's just the reality. Uh, I, I wish I could show you my first lighting reel. <laughs> my, I, I just, it should be floating around somewhere. I'd like to release it someday and just I'd die laughing looking at it. But <laughs> I, yeah, definitely. I like just uh, be, be passionate. <laughs> yeah, I don't. Yeah. It, nope. it sounds That's it sounds something. like I should be displaying a picture of a kitten when I'm saying exactly. this, right? Like it's a <laughs> it's one of those motivational posters, but it, but it's true. It's the truth. Every single person I work for work with is this. They're passionate. They're interested. They take ownership. They're really interested in learning. Actually, that's a good one. Be hungry for knowledge. Go read a lot. That's that's probably where I got most of my stuff. I'd, like even you know an interesting article pops up, uh, learning how the retina, like translates photons into electronic signals to the brain does that help me be a better better lighting artist not really but it's it makes me understand this this art form and this science and this technology better so i completely agree i completely yeah. agree well boone thank you so much for just taking the time you know out of your weekend um to enlighten us um enlighten you know, us well done process. yeah <laughs> <laughs> like that <laughs> I did. Were you were you waiting the entire session I to was, use that? You know, <laughs> Trying to get this, I was like, "Come on!" Um, but, <laughs> well, thank you again, guys, and uh, this is Manny signing off, and we'll see you guys uh, in a couple weeks.